to the Dancing Bear Enlightenment Academy Holistic Spiritual Transformation Podcast. I almost said summit. This is the podcast. <laughs> I'm your host, Dr. Beverly. And today we have a wonderful guest, Shalanda Treasure Williams Lanard. I hope I said that right. She is a spirit solistic coach. Interesting word. We'll have to ask her about that. She is known to many as the inspirational treasure, is a spiritual leader, teacher, as well as a mental health support coach. She is an inspirational speaker and a transformational encourager and best-selling author whose mission is to help women find their true essence through the healing of the heart, mind, and will. Today, she will talk to us about heal your soul, free your spirit. So, welcome, Shalanda, Shalanda, welcome. Hi, Dr. Beverly. How are you today? We're doing great. Welcome to the show. So, I'm excited to be here. I'm honored. Tell us your transformational story. How did you get to be known as the inspirational treasure? Oh, man. So I've, I'm the youngest of a lot of kids, right? And so I've spent a lot of years trying to play catch up, right? A lot of years trying to build my self-worth to not feel like I'm at the bottom all the time. And that did not come easily, okay? It came with a lot of trying to prove myself, which turned into all type of, of hardships from sexual addictions to um depression, deep depression. Um, in 2013, I was finally diagnosed with, with what my symptoms were showing. And that's what I call it. Uh, I was, I was just really reckless in my heart and mind, but it wasn't because I was trying to be rebellious. It was because I was trying to matter, if that makes sense. And so I spent a lot of time doing that, which again, caused a lot. So six children later, <laughs> Six children later, five of them um, outside of wedlock. And when I say outside of wedlock, you can you can tell that that's because I'm from a religious background. And so immediately um, you think about the restrictions of who you can't be, what you can't do. And I think I was competing with a lot of that over my life. And so it took me a lot of years to build myself work back up to say, Shalanda, this is not what you have to do to matter. Right. Because God loves you no matter what. He made all conditions. Yours ain't nothing. OK. And so um, I, I, spent, I spent a lot of time doing that. And so with that being said, I had to deal with my mental health. Right. My soul, my mind, my will, my emotions. I had to take my will back, uh, realizing that I have a choice. And, you know, uh, at one time, I didn't think I had a choice. Dr. Beverly, at one time I laid there in the dark. Please don't come in. Don't talk to me. Don't speak to me. Don't do any of that. Um, because I don't really know what to say to you. I don't know how to be what you want me to be. I don't know how to strive to make myself the best performance you've ever seen, right? So just leave me be. And it caused me a lot of spiraling, you know, a lot of spiraling. But what transformed me is the fact that I wasn't just doing church like I learned. I actually wanted God. I wanted more. And I knew that there were times where I felt absolutely safe. So I pushed into that, you know, God, this can't be what everybody's saying because I can feel you with me. I can feel your love for me. I can feel this comfort. And so I leaned into that. And I mean, I leaned in hard. Uh, I was honest. If I felt like screaming, yelling, cursing, whatever I needed to do, I did it. And I didn't get struck down with lightning. Dr. Beverly, I was good. <laughs> So because I didn't get struck, I figured, hey, maybe it's more to this God thing than what I've learned and that I'm not totally damned for being me. Right. And that's where my transformation came. I, I pressed into love. I owned it, not just for other people, because I was used to giving it, but feeling it was something totally different. And so I just leaned all the way in and transformation just began to happen because you can't really sit with love and not feel something, right? Because it cast out all fear. And I, I just embraced that, embraced it with my whole heart. Yep. <laughs> Sounds like a typical story. <laughs> yeah. I think everybody I interview has been through some kind of horror story of some kind. And and you, you sort of reach the bottom and then you have to pull yourself up. And mm -hmm. the only person that can do that is you. 
Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's a powerful lesson to learn because when you come from the background, okay, so here's here's a real skinny, okay. My my father is is one of 19 children. Okay, so <laughs> Yeah, so and two of them died when they were young, but 17 of them lived into adulthood. He was in the top four children. So imagine being in the top four and having all of these siblings underneath you. But not only that, my grandfather was a bishop in the holiness church. Okay, so talk about the, the <laughs> look, yeah. talk about the pressing. <laughs> this one woman had all yeah. those kids. Yeah, she did. She was actually pregnant 23 times um, and she lost some and then two of them died when they were young, but 17 of them lived. And so just the pressure of being him, um, he he didn't raise me, but I got a lot of the residue. Right. And so that that trying to feel like you matter. Well, needless to say, they were raised in fundamentalist Christendom. So that's all they knew. Strict was it. You couldn't go inside, outside, and you had to depend on God to do everything for you. They didn't know to teach us that the kingdom was within us and that we had the power to do it. And so that's a part of that transformation is recognizing that I'm not just waiting for something to happen. And I needed that because, again, with that doctrine, I'm laying there waiting for God to take it. You know what I mean? God, take it from me. I'm at the altar. Like, I mean, at the altar every single time. I had no shame. I wasn't that girl that was sitting there pretending. Okay. When I, the night before, I probably did something, a lot of somethings. I probably walked in the church and saw some of the people I was doing it with. Yeah. And so I wasn't ashamed. I'm going to the altar. I'm going to cry out because that's what I was taught to do. And while I'm crying and nothing's happening, there has to be another answer. There has to be a different answer because I don't want to die here. And I've had so many. One, 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 of the, one of the stories that I remember, I mean, really, my daughter, she's 10 now. But one day I was, I was laying in the bed. I was pregnant with my seven-year-old. And I was sitting, laying next to all the pill bottles, right? And I'm like, I just want this pain to stop. You know what I mean? It's, it's the pain you can't touch. Um, that's when I really became a mental health advocate because I understand that pain you can't touch. And I wanted it to stop. And so I'm thinking, you know, I'll just do it. You know, if they, you know, if I go, it'll at least it'll be in my sleep. They won't, you know. But my baby girl, three, she was like one or two at the time. And she came in the room and she's dancing, dancing all over the place. And tears are streaming. I mean, I'm so, I'm crying so hard. My eyes are blurry. And I only know it's her because her voice, right? And she is, she comes over and she starts wiping my face. Mommy, it's okay. It's going to be okay. So I'm looking at this baby and I'm thinking in my mind, there's no way I can allow her to come in here and find me dead. Now, like that would be the hor most horrible trauma for her, for the older kids. And yeah. I can't let that happen. So yeah. let me get up. Let me go to my mom's. And I was going to my mother's house, got there. And I said, hey, I'm about to go to the hospital. I'm going to check myself in. We got to figure out what to do because I can't keep going like this. I think that was one of the first steps to me saying, y'all ain't going to have to check me in. I'm going to go get this help for myself because something else has to be the answer. It's not that I'm filled with no demon because you can't medicate a demon. I'm not a demon. I'm dealing with traumas and issues and circumstances that nobody taught me how to get over. They taught me to pacify it. And so now I don't want to pacify. I want to heal. Yeah. So we took that journey, the journey to healing. Yeah. Yeah. Most people are taught to ignore it. Or, you know, when I was raised, it was, uh, if you cry, if you don't stop crying, I'll give you something to cry. About. To cry and, yeah. 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 Uh, if you don't like it, I'll, I'll beat you again or whatever, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, I, I think today it's not as bad, but I think they went too far the other way today. They're, they're just, Give no kids boundaries. anything they want. Don't punish them. Teach them no boundaries. Well, yeah. you have to have boundaries. You just don't need to beat into you, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, I think trauma just begets more trauma until you start dealing. And that's, that's where uh, this walk for me is very important, right? The, the law of love is not just something I heard about. That's something I experienced. Yeah. And what I realized is that many of the people who were trying to get me to be better, they didn't 
they didn't do what I needed. They did what they felt like I needed. And so I had to learn what Shalanda needed. You know, mm-hmm. what is it that, that, that is going to help you to be better? And so I started, you know, researching and looking for different things. And, and, and that was in itself a liberty step. Because of course, again, coming from that background, you can't ask questions, you can't read other things, you can't yoga. What you mean yoga? What you are you? Why are you postured like this? You know all these different things, and you're like, well, wait a minute, is he the god of all or not? (laughs) Like I'm confused. You know where did the ideas come from? And so what I learned is, Shalanda, the same grace and love that you are being given, this is the message that I wanted for the world in the first place. So, you know, loving, bearing the burdens of one another, it wasn't about make, letting you make excuses. It was about understanding that you have a weakness. Okay, let's figure out what you need to get strength. And then when you get strong, then somebody else does. But many of the, the parents or the people from different generations, they weren't allowed that. They weren't allowed to say, I'm hurt. Yeah. <laughs> Cause, right. you know they gave, they got the same thing that they gave you know gave their children shut up i'll give you something to cry for and it probably was even worse then we don't got time for that get out here and work these fields get out here and you know what i mean so trauma begets trauma and so now i'm in the position where i'm saying guess what y'all love begets love let's let's start something different something new and let's help people to realize that they don't have to succumb to the pressure no nobody's going to do it for you but at least let me get you a little bit of strength first so you can do it for yourself well finding that inner strength is what you need to find <laughs> yep yep that's and, and sometimes through yeah and sometimes and and that's what i mean so you sometimes need those people i remember um one of the young ladies i used to go to church with she showed up at my house i had gotten pregnant again for the fourth time <laughs> um i was in the choir at the time i was you know serving and and i felt so disappointed with myself um, because of the rhetoric I was getting, you know what I mean? You got to do this. You got to measure up to this standard. And here I am pregnant again, number four, and I'm not going back. I won't go. I'm embarrassed. I don't want to do, you know, and she showed up at my house and, and, and her name is, her name is Michelle Roche. I talk about her all the time. Um, giant, she's a giant to me, but she said, okay, you're pregnant. Now what? <laughs> okay, okay. You're pregnant. It happened. You did it. Let's do it. Now what? And actually that was the the third time, my third, my, 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 no, that was my fourth pregnancy. What are we going to do now? And so when she asked the question, it stirred up something in me again to, okay, Shalonda, there's something you can do about it. And a part of that was hushing the chatter that I was hearing because I didn't want to be a disappointment, right? Again, when you're, when you're raised to think that everything you do is a sin and it's wrong and you're bad and God hates that and he's going to punish you for it, then you kind of grow up with this idea that I got to perform to be loved. I got to be perform to be accepted. And, and so I had to get out of that place and listen to the question she asked. Now what? Now, now what are you going to do? And so I took that to my prayer time. I took that and I, and I just said that I said, okay, God, there's that you made me for something you create, you are expressing yourself through me to do something. What is that? And let me find out what it is so that I can live in that. Because until I get to where I'm purpose, or I feel like I have something, I'm going to keep going through the same inner dialogue rehearsing the same things that they said to me before. And until I can free myself from this, you know, and so now when I work with women, when I work with them, I'm listening to stories, Dr. Beverly, like some of these stories, I'm like, you know, I know I've been through some stuff, but this stuff, yeah, this, stuff, I mean, from, from childhood on up, not knowing, you know, how, how do I fight against this person that's violating my space? You know, how do I stop from dreaming about it? And so all of these things, trying to teach people to get their strength back and find their inner strength. It takes it takes somebody to say, okay, I get it. You can't stay here though. So let's do what it needs to, you know, what needs to be done for us to get out of this place. Yeah. 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 I know exactly what you're saying. After I graduated from high school, I went to college. I spent a year trying to figure out how to kill myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think that that's a common place people go to when you just don't know what to do anymore. You don't have the skills. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to turn. No. And you either pull yourself out or someone kicks you. And I think the un- the universe sent me an angel. <laughs> this yeah. guy walked up to me and said, why do you have that dark makeup around your eyes? 
And I went home mm. and looked at myself and I went, oh, and I erased it and it just went away. I no longer was suicidal Yeah. Myself for the first time. Oh, I exist. I'm here. I don't need to leave. That's beautiful. Um, so that's beautiful. It takes a lot to get there, though. It definitely yeah. takes a lot. But you, like you said, but that's, I think ultimately what you said is what I, I believe because we are all one technically. So God calls to God. He calls to himself. He knows when a piece of him needs something. And that angel you talked about, like that, that's where, when we work on our inner selves, our hearts, then we can exude it to the outside. Right. But it has to start inwardly. I have one book called what that heart looked like. Like it's, it's like what that heart looked like. You got to ask yourself the question, right? What's in there? Is it rejection in there still? Do I feel abandoned? Do I feel like I'm never going to be enough? What, what conversations are you still having with yourself over and over again? Because until you can stop that chatter, you can't yeah. play a new track. And so he gave you something you went and you said, I saw myself for the first time. Like that's so powerful to me. That is so powerful to me. That's so true. So tell us um, how you help people. What, what, how, how do you work with people? So I have, I am, I, I serve in multiple capacities, and that's where the name Inspirational Treasure comes from. Because um, a part of me gaining my self worth was accepting all the parts of me, right? Accepting the fact that I'm not just talented in one way, or I don't just have one gift. I have multiple gifts, um, and I'm called to different people in different arenas. So. I'm an apostle in the in uh, as far as by spiritual practice is concerned, prophetic. And uh, I'm a coach. I'm an author. I'm a spoken word artist. Uh, a few things in there, but it just speaks to different people in their own language, if that makes sense. They're just assignments. And so um, as an apostle, those who are of, of following their religious paths or religious practices. They come to me for prayer. They come to me for spiritual insight. Uh, and I just yield myself to it. Right. I don't know everything. God, only God knows. So let's let's, you know, yield myself to that. But as a coach, I'm the same person just with different languages. Right. We talk uh, the educational stuff. Let's talk about where grief comes from. Let's talk about how to tackle that. Let's talk about your self-esteem issues and why you are there. Um, and one of the things that I do at the beginning of all of my um, group coaching is, hey, let's tell God the truth about how you feel. And that's probably one of the hardest assignments for most people because they're afraid to be honest, which is crazy, right? Because though he knows our things already, but they, they'll say, well, should I, should I say this? Or can I say that don't filter, just say. Some of them, when they finally release themselves, they probably got a million curse words going on. They're probably like screaming. They're probably like, you, <laughs> whatever. But I give them that liberty, right? Because the first thing that I help them to do is be honest with themselves. Because if you can't be honest with you, how are we going to address it? Yeah. If you can't be honest about it, how do we deal with it? So I don't, you don't want to be there. You're telling me you're done. You're tired. You're over it. Okay. If you're over it, let me find out. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me find out. I, I'll know if you're tired by what you're willing to do to get out of it. Right. And, and so that with me, that entails some things because sometimes they are literally dead weight. Like they're so far gone and so tired, Dr. Beverly, to the point where they're like, listen, I don't have the strength to do this, bro. So, you know, sometimes you got a spoon feed. What do you do with somebody who's totally dehydrated? You have to fill them with fluid first. And so with some of them, it takes time. You know, they, they may show up today and be like, you know what? I All I can do is say I'm here. Congratulations. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you for showing up. Because the mm -hmm. fact that you showed up, you know what I mean? Now I can give you a little nugget. Let me tell you. So today, all I want you to do is continue to tell yourself and remind yourself of how loved you are. You're going to get this strength. So me helping people, it just depends on where they are. But as long as they're willing, I'm willing. I'm willing. And we can take this journey. It may take for some. I've been working with some people right now for 10 years. And it's not that they are not making any progress, but they have so much trauma, like Again, you know, when you if you watch your mom get, you know, murdered before you or, you know, you got some things that no matter what nobody tell you, you don't trust nobody. I'm done. I, I don't I don't trust you. And so it takes time to build that because they heard people say I love you before. 
And those same people were tired after a week. They were done with you after a month. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm in it for the long haul. And if there's ever a time when God says, let them be, then that's the time when I have to walk away. And that's tough for me, but I, I, I do obey. I do obey. It's hard when you realize that you can't help somebody. Yeah. Um, that's when you have to have a list of people you can refer others to. Because yeah. um, I can't help everybody. You can't help everybody. But sometimes we may know who can. Yep. So I just refer them out when I know I can't help them. That's 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 so true. And, you know, um, so biblically, faith, Jesus used to say, will thou be made whole? And that question was to the person because he wasn't just doing everything for them. It was them believing that it could happen that helped them, you know. And so he would say, ask that question. And that's where I sit today. You know, will thou be made whole? Because if you be made, if you want to be made whole, we can go through the motions. We can do that. And if there is, like you said, something I can't do, hey, I got a home girl. I you look, listen, I know a Dr. Beverly who know a whole lot. She done did a lot of research. And I may be able to, you know, or or Andrea or Katja, or I I know people who may be able to assist you. Hey, let me send you this this video by Dr. Uh, uh, Michael Beckwith, or let me let me share with you what I got from you know Susie Moore, Susan Moore, or let me because or or Reverend Ike. <laughs> I mean, who whoever, because we again we're one to another. I'm not here to hog it up. You know what I mean? Like if there's somebody who can give you something that I can't, by all means, be nourished. Be nourished and be whole. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So true. Um, so um, why why are you called a treasure? Where, is, where so does that, that come from? So, so the story, when I, when I just mentioned that I was pregnant for the fourth time. So after I asked the question, that's good. That's a good segue right there. Oh, so after after I asked God the question, what do I do now? You know, um, what do I do now? He said, right. And I said, oh, okay, right. What? As a matter of fact, I was in the, I had just wrote my first book when I found out I was pregnant and it was of a Christian nature. So I felt even more embarrassed, like, <gasps> you know what I mean? And so after he said, right. And I said, right, what? I already wrote the book. And he had me write in inmates. You know, I've come to preach the good news. Write a what? To inmates. What's prisoners? Inmate? Oh, to prisoners. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. And, oh, and right, so I, right to the inmates. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I so get right it. to the inmates. And um, I was like, okay, I could do that. Because again, you know, I'm holding on to my teachings. And, and one of the things that, that Christ Joshua said is I come to bring good news to the, to the prisoners, set the captives free. Right. And so I may not be able to open the door and let you out, but I can give you something. And so I started writing, um, inmates and one of them didn't write me back right away. As a matter of fact, it took like six months. And when he finally did write me back, we became instant friends. Like, I mean, the connection was crazy. The dialogue that we wrote every day, we were building each other up. And he used to call me all type of names, like, you know, just different little names to express who he felt like I was. And one day I said, um, if you could name me one thing and that's the last name you call me, you know, forever, what would it be? And he literally didn't hesitate. And he said, treasure. And I said, well, why? And he sent me a message, a poem, and it said, a treasure is still a treasure, even when it's beneath the dirt. It just doesn't know it. And sometimes when you have to get, you know, when the treasures are dug up or you go in the mines and you're in, it doesn't know its value. It's just being. The treasure is just being. We've attached value to certain things. And so he says it's, it's still a treasure, even beneath all the dirt you've, you, you've been through, the things that you feel, and you are going to shine someday. And so that was in 2017. Back in... uh. No, that was in 2007 and 2015, 16, I pledged a Christian sorority and it was called Tall Alpha Delta. And of course we had to get our line names 
right? And so the big sister who was doing our line names, she's not social media friendly. Like, so she's not online. She didn't know anything about our personal stuff. And she named me Trey Ashore. It was so interesting. My my son's godmother, she was like, oh my gosh. Um, but she, Trey Ashore, um, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit affirms you or assures you that you are absolutely valuable. So the name is the name is the name, but to me, it's 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 a reminder. You know, it's a reminder for who I am and that I'm valued by God and that who I am has some type of validity. I'm not just here to hold up space. And then I get to shine that light, that 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 light, see the light on the um coming out of my mouth. I get to give of this treasure to other people so they'll know their treasures, too. Yeah. Nice. That's a good one. That's a nice story. <laughs> Thank you. So- you have a free gift or for our audience rethinking your oppression. So what yeah. does that mean? <laughs> oh man. So most of us and a lot of the stories that I'm telling are about my depression, right? Suppression because I can't tell this, I can't share this. Uh, my oppression growing up in different places that kept me bound up, not able to be free enough to say, um, I can associate with you and we can vibe. And you don't even have to believe the same thing as me. What? Okay. I, we, we can, we can bubble. So, <laughs> so it was a lot of oppression, a lot. And, and, and again, you don't really know it when you're growing up until that you hit that wall and you're like, something has to give. And so what I'm asking the, the ladies to do or those who download this is to rethink it. Like rethink that question. Um, I have a group, a, a women's coaching group called Inspired Up. Depression. Um, and so we just change in the dialogue. You don't have to live with depression as your garment. Um, one of the things that I know is that when a person lives with depression, it's like the blankie. You know, the blankie on Charlie Brown. You know, who had, um, was it Linus? Linus had Linus. his blankie. <laughs> and, and you couldn't get it. You couldn't get it. No matter how dirty it was, it was theirs to hold. And so our depression becomes our blankie sometimes. And if somebody extends a hand and say, hey, how can I help you? Or give me that. I'll exchange this for this. If you, you know, it's hard to give it up. And so they hold it as their blankie. So rethinking your oppression is, guess what? You get to choose. You don't want to give it to me. Okay. You hold on to it, but at least let me give you something to clean it and wash it. And then maybe after you get it cleaned and washed, it won't be the same anymore. It smells different. So you're going to want to exchange. So when you start rethinking your oppression, you start asking questions like, I see happy people all the time. So can I possibly be happy? Uh, I see people who, you know, who, who live their lives and they're and they're taking trips and they have families and they're. I see the stories of the people who overcame depression. I see the ones who were in it. I mean, deep in it, and all of a sudden now they're living their best life. Rethink your oppression. Do I have to be in bondage? No, <laughs> love does not bound. Love allows. Love lets you blossom. Love lets you grow. And if you believe that God is love and love is without condition, then baby, <laughs> we can do this thing, right? So rethink your oppression. Do you have to have it? Or can we up-press? Let's, let's do that. Let's up-press. So rethinking it. Up-press. So rethinking your oppression is R-Y-P. So remember that. So if you're on YouTube, the link is down below. But if you're listening to this, I'll tell you the link. It's a bit.ly link, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash. And then in all caps, R-Y-P, like Rethink Your Oppression, mini course. So all caps, R-Y-P, mini course. Okay. Do you have any closing words for our audience? Listen, so I want to encourage those that are listening to me to to do your spirit holistic work, right? And and what I mean by that is you want to reach your spiritual liberation, then you got to do your soul's healing. Your soul being your mind, your heart, and your 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 will. You got to be able to realize that, hey, my mind can be transformed and I can make different decisions. If I heal my heart, then I can go to another place and I can love again and I can expand this reach of mine and um, I'll enjoy my life. But one of the biggest things is freeing your will, being liberated, 
because so many of us have been bound for so long. It's almost like I think um, Bishop Carlton Pearson, which is, you know, one of my mentors from afar, he just transitioned um, a couple of days ago. But one thing that he he said in his book, The Gospel of Inclusion, was it's almost like a plantation, right? And when you're on a plantation, you feel restricted, you're bound, you're in slavery. But then somebody comes along and they say, hey, we got freedom. We have freedom. And you're like looking around for trouble instead of just going for freedom. And so when you free your will, it's like saying, you know what? Let me follow the freedom trail. I know that if I make this decision, now listen, everything is not beneficial for you. So definitely check yourself. If it, if it don't work, forget it. But if it does work, embrace it and live it and love it. And then you'll begin to love yourself more. And then you can spread that love abroad. Very good. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being our thank guest you. today, Shalanda. Thank you. It was you. fun talking to you as always. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you everyone for joining us and remember to be the light you want to see in the world.